get yeah. into um, the rate of consolidation. So how fast does consolidation happen? And to motivate our discussion of this, we'll go back to the piston analogy. And this is where we had a uh, piston here inside of a cylinder filled up with fluid, and there's a spring supporting that piston. If we put a force on the top of it, slowly over time, water will come out of the small hole in the piston, and as the water comes out, the piston will settle and load the spring and take pressure off of the fluid. So initially, all the pressure goes on the fluid, and then slowly over time, as the water comes out, uh, the force is transferred to the spring and off of the fluid. So what we'll do now is take these forces and convert them to stresses. So sigma v naught prime is going to be the force in the spring divided by the cross-sectional area of the cylinder, and delta sigma v is, well, sigma v naught prime is the force applied up here divided by the cross-sectional area, and we're assuming that all of the force initially is in the spring, that we've loaded the cylinder up and it's had plenty of time to come into equilibrium so that all the water has already um, leaked out of the small hole from the previous loading stage. And then we're going to add an additional load, so that delta sigma v is delta f divided by a. So if we look at what happens, let, let's first, let's focus on the water pressure. Okay, what I'm going to do here is plot water pressure versus depth, and we'll assume it's hydrostatic, so the slope of this line would be the unit weight of water, um, this pressure versus depth. And um, I'm going to use notation here that has t equals zero minus, which means that that's a time equal zero, but before the load is applied. And we're going to assume that this delta f is applied instantaneously, and it takes it immediately up to t equals zero plus, which is now immediately after the load is applied. So what happens is that immediately all of the pressure goes into the water, so delta sigma v is uh, the distance between the water pressure at time equals zero minus and the, time, and the water pressure at time equals zero plus. All right, now what will happen is that slowly over time, the water will start leaking out of here because there's no pressure on the outside of the piston, high pressure on the inside, so there's a hydraulic radiant pushing water out. And at some time later, you would have this plot, and some time after that, you would have this plot, and eventually, as time goes to infinity, the water pressure will go right back to where it was when it started. So t equals zero plus is way out here, t equals infinity is back, again, with t equals zero minus. All right, now one thing that we'll do is we're going to subtract out the hydrostatic component of the water pressure and deal only with excess water pressure. So here we have UE, that's excess water pressure, and that's just equal to, I suppose I should define it here, uh, UE is equal to U minus UH, where uh, UH is hydrostatic. So, what that means is that um, UE is what's really causing hydraulic radiance to exist and pushing water out. So, that's, that's the one that we'll look at. It's of a lot of interest to us. So, if we plot excess pore pressure here, this would be UE. This is just U. Um, okay, immediately the water pressure goes up to, the excess pressure goes up to delta sigma V, and then slowly over time it decreases. And notice that there's no slope anymore because we've subtracted out the hydrostatic pressure. So what that means is that, you know, um, at time equals zero, we have an effective stress profile that's there, that's the force in the spring. We're ignoring the self-weight of the spring here, assuming all the force acting on the top is all that exists in the spring. And that's at time equals zero minus V right there. Then when at the time equals zero plus, we apply the load, but all of the pressure has been taken by the water, and the spring hasn't started deforming yet, so we haven't changed the force in the spring. Therefore, the effective stress stays the same. And then only as the excess pore pressure decreases do we get an increase in effective stress. As water goes out, load is transferred to the spring. So you can see that there's an inverse relationship here between the change in excess pressure with time and the increase in effective stress with time. Okay, now, um, this is a useful analogy for us to start to understand consolidation behavior of soil, but of course there's a problem that soil has distributed stiffness and distributed hydraulic conductivity, and, you know, 
this is kind of a discrete example where you have one piston, one cylinder. Um, so, but, you know, we can extend this now to a multi-piston analogy. So we're going to keep it discrete, but instead of one cylinder and one book, we'll start one cylinder, but we'll have multiple pistons, maybe with three different chambers inside of that cylinder. So if we go to this analogy over here now, uh, we still have this F plus delta F. Everything is the same as before. Um, but let's think about what happens. We're applying a load. Initially, all of the load is taken by the pore fluid in here. Um, the pressure at this point is the same as the, the excess pressure at this point is the same as the excess pressure at that point. So there's no hydraulic gradient pushing water out of chamber three. The excess pressure at this point is the same as the excess pressure at that point at time t equals zero plus. Therefore, there's also no hydraulic gradient pushing water out of chamber two into chamber one. Then we come to chamber one. The excess pressure here is high, but the excess pressure above that hole is small. So we immediately get a hydraulic gradient and water starts exiting chamber number one. As the water exits chamber number one, the pressure of the water in chamber number one goes down start getting a gradient from 2 to 1. And then as the gradient from 2 to 1 pushes water out, you start getting a gradient from 3 to 1. So what ends up happening is that the water pressure goes down in chamber 1 first, then in chamber 2, and then in chamber 3. And so there's this kind of lagged time based on which chamber you're in. And that's shown here. Sorry, the bright green is a little hard to see here. Um, this would be the, well, let's look at water pressure first. So here's um, T equals zero plus. All of the water pressure goes into the uh, all of the pressure goes into the fluid. It dissipates more quickly in chamber one, then less quickly in chamber two, and the slowest in chamber three. And then some other time you'd be right here with these green lines, and this is increasing time. And again, as time goes to infinity, we'll return back to the initial condition for water pressure. If we look at it in terms of excess pressure, we start there. Same thing though. We dissipate through chamber one first, then chamber two, and then chamber three. Similarly, the effective stress increases first in chamber one, then in chamber two, and then in chamber three, and over time it increases at that same ratio. Eventually, all of them go back to being, um, well, all of them will go to the final vertical effective stress right there. Uh, okay, so I've written some text here that describes this idea. The key thing to remember is that. Dissipation of pressure happens fastest up at the very top, which we'll call the drainage boundary. That's where the water has to get out um, and leave the uh, cylinder. And that is something that is true of soil, as we'll see when we go to Terzaghi's one-dimensional consolidation equation. So now, although this analogy has taught us a key concept, it still is not really continuous, right? We still have three little chambers that are discrete, and we'd like to make this more of a continuous equation, which will come in the next video.